Well, good evening once again. I would like to uh, walk us through an article tonight called Are We There Yet? by Paul Wolf. And this is found on banneroftruth.org. So banneroftruth.org, Are We There Yet? And it was published um, just uh, a week or so ago, June 26th. He writes, we Christians are heaven-bound pilgrims. The question is, do we see ourselves that way? Have we fostered this kind of pilgrim mentality in our own lives? If not, then impatience may be the culprit. In this respect, many of us have been shaped by our culture more than we care to admit. To put it mildly, our culture is not long on patience. Today, conversations are short, commercials are short, meals are short. Sadly, many marriages are short. In short, our collective patience has run short. Even sentences can be cut short. But the Christian life is long. Yes, it looks short next to eternity, but the Christian life is still long in the sense that it is literally lifelong from the time you become a Christian until the time you die, which makes it longer than many other things. It outlasts many careers and relationships and governments and institutions and sports dynasties. Thus, understanding the Christian life as a pilgrimage requires us to think and live in terms of a long, arduous journey. Jonathan Edwards once preached a sermon on Hebrews 11, the great Hall of Faith passage. The sermon was entitled, The Christian Pilgrim, or The True Christian's Life, A Journey Towards Heaven. And in that sermon, Edwards had this to say, Long journeys are attended with toil and fatigue especially if through a wilderness. Persons in such a case expect no other than to suffer hardships and weariness. And so we should travel in this way of holiness, improving our time and strength to surmount the difficulties and obstacles that are in the way. The land that we have to travel through is a wilderness, and there are many mountains, rocks, and rough places that we must go over, and therefore there is a necessity that we should lay out our strength. This Christian life is no easy journey. The pilgrimage takes patience. And it's precisely there that we struggle so much, and I will say, guilty as charged. Children are notorious for pestering their parents from the back seat of the car during long drives, right? Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Now, for the parents, this makes the long drive seem even longer. Of course, when the grandparents hear about this, they recognize it for what it is. Payback. Years ago, those who are now the tormented were the tormentors. The torch has been passed, it seems, to a new generation. The parent who has been asked several times, are we there yet? may reply, calmly, or not so calmly, if we were there, we still wouldn't be driving on the interstate, now would we? But that reply only has the effect of changing the question to, are we almost there? Are we almost there? Are we almost there? We sinners are an impatient lot. Sometimes when Christians recite scripture passages from memory, they succumb to the temptation to recite so quickly that they appear to be racing someone else who got a head start. I know these words. Let me hurry up. Let me get through them just to prove it. This is especially ironic when the passage in question is, say, Paul's description of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Ready? I'll try to hurry up and get through this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down. Wait. Go back. Was the word patience in there? Was that in the list? One evening after dinner, he writes, as my wife and I were cleaning up in the kitchen, one of our children may have made his way in front of the living room and revealed to us that something was troubling him. Daddy, 
he said. I don't think we're ever going to get to heaven. Well, naturally, my attention quickly turned from drying dishes and wiping the countertops to the weighty spiritual concerns of my little one. I gently probed, well, Why do you say that? He answered, Because it's taking so long to get to heaven. Priceless. On the one hand, it was hill, uh, thrilling for me to hear as his father and uh, to, to see that heaven seemed so real to him. I've seen that at other times, too, like the time when our children were interrogating their well-traveled babysitter about all the places in the world that she had visited, until finally the same son asked with wonder, Have you been to heaven? He knows heaven's real. He, he knows it to be the destiny of God's children, even if he didn't quite understand at that particular time all the ins and outs of going there and staying there. On the other hand, his words in the kitchen that evening struck me as a poignant expression of the impatience that some Christians do feel about going to heaven. We may find it hard to give ourselves wholeheartedly to a difficult journey that takes many, many years. And so instead, we settle for an impoverished, waiting around sort of spirituality. And our Christian lives become practically aimless. I'm just killing time. I'm just here until the real fun or the real um, destination arrives. And we forget about the here and the now. Instead of pilgrims, we see ourselves as sitters, sitting on a bench, waiting for the bus, content to nod off until heaven arrives. Diagnosis, spiritual stagnation. And so what's the solution to this plight? How can a pilgrim mentality be nurtured? The solution, in part, lies in grasping the fact that heaven will be worth the wait, or, more fully, worth the wait march. There's that helpful hyphen right there, a wait march. Yes, it will take your whole life to get to heaven. Yes, your life may last longer than most. And yes, the Christian life will be a challenging journey from start to finish. But it is going to be worth it. Not only will heaven itself vastly outweigh the difficulties that you knew and that I knew in getting there, but the life that you lived here will have been richer for the sense of the pilgrimage that you brought to it. You tell me, which is the more satisfying way to spend a day? All right? Sitting relatively motionless on a bench or successfully hiking a challenging climb. Now, some of you absolutely cannot stand hiking. So maybe a nice, long, beautiful walk along the beach. What's more satisfying, sitting around or doing one of those two things? Which is the more satisfying way to conceive of your Christian life, sitting around or undertaking the journey with intentionality? You see, like all parents, he writes, my wife and I have had to teach our children about patience when we were younger. If our kids insisted on being served some di dish at the dinner table right away, we would sometimes say to them with deliberate pauses between syllables, you need to be pay extra long pause shunt we intended to illustrate by the tempo of our words the very patience to which we were calling them does not our heavenly father train us in a similar way think about the tempo of his words that is, think about the Bible. Think about how the saving purposes of God are not all revealed right away, right after the fall. But they're revealed gradually, as God patiently articulates and accomplishes from Genesis to the book of Revelation. From what's called uh, protology, the study of before all things, to eschatology, the study of the end times, from Adam until Christ. The Bible is our Father's illustrative way of saying to his children, you need to be patient.
patient. The Apostle Peter reminds us that God himself is patient. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. 2 Peter 3.8. And he urges us to be patient too. And so the good news is we can be. Patience is named among the fruit of the Spirit. Let's read Galatians 5.22 slowly, and you will see it there. For the fruit of the Spirit is dot, 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 and patience is a part of that. Our Father not only calls us to be patient, but he also gives that gift by the transforming power of his Spirit. His Spirit cultivates patience within us. If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience, teaches the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 25. And we have the Spirit to thank for that. If you find yourself to be a generally impatient person, and again, depending on the topic or depending on what it is I'm waiting for, I can be patient or I can be very, very impatient. And if you find yourself to be a, a generally impatient person and thus reluctant to embrace the identity pilgrim, then return to these truths and return humbly in prayer to the Spirit whose grace you need. Ask the Spirit of God to help you. Ask Him to stir you so that you rise up from your sitting down and you fall in with the hopeful, determined company that you see marching by and singing as they go. That's the Christian life. And so, dear Christian, your destiny is heaven. Your home is heaven. And so get up and go there. Now, thankfully, we pilgrims do not have to wait until we reach heaven to know something of its glories. As we see in Hebrews chapter 11, if you were to read through that, the church is assemblies for worship, ideally in person, but even when we gather online, are foretastes of a heavenly experience. And then, even when the worship service ends and we go our separate ways, we continue to enjoy inbreakings of the heavenly life now, even in the midst of sin and sorrow and rioting and turmoil and pandemics and, and, and. After all, heaven is a world of love, as well as a, a world of joy and peace and holiness and fellowship. And the heaven-bound pilgrim has already begun to experience, in part, but experience nonetheless, those realities, both in his religious exercises and in his earthly callings, insofar as he or she knows and serves the Lord, he has begun to live his future life. The Christian life on earth is a life which is lived in the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 9. And what is heaven but the most spirit-filled world? Thus our pilgrimage here and now is infused with a sense of the reality of our destination. The way to heaven is by practicing, in small part, heaven. As Jonathan Edwards put it, the way to heaven is a heavenly life, an imitation of those who are in heaven in their holy enjoyments, loving, adoring, serving, and praising God and the Lamb. This is what prepares us. Yes, we enter heaven only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but we start to get fit for heaven, if you will, by practicing a heavenly life. Think about that for a moment. In the hymn, Come, We That Love the Lord, the great hymn writer Isaac Watts puts it this way. The men of grace have found glory begun below. Celestial fruits on earthly ground from faith and hope may grow. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets before we reach the heavenly fields or walk the golden streets. And then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We are marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high. In John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, Emmanuel's land was the territory within the sight of the city, that is, near to the celestial city, which was the main character Pilgrim's ultimate destination. Isaac Watts is saying that that is where we find ourselves now, 
in sight of the end, not yet having reached it, but marching on until we do. In the meantime, we experience foretastes. Glory begun below. Glory before we get there. No, we never sing, come we that love the Lord, in our school choirs. You're not going to turn that on America's Got Talent and find someone singing it there. But Isaac Watts's nerve, or words, touch a nerve, just like the poetry of the, uh, the various spirituals um, that were sung. There's something about a hymn. There's something about a well-written praise song. There's something about well-written poetry that captures the glories of heaven and uh, paints another world to encourage us in our journey. To top it off, Isaac Watts's hymn is a pilgrim song that encourages even more singing. Let our songs abound, wrote Isaac Watts. He was right, let them abound. Think of all the armies throughout history that have sung as they marched. Was there ever a marching people with more cause to sing than the people of Jesus Christ? This world is not our home. We were created for another world, and we are on our way there. No one who spends his life earnestly going there will ever look back and regret it and say, boy, I wish I was back on earth with the pandemic, with rioting, with racism, with hatred, with a cancel culture, with cancer, and on and on. Who is ever going to want to come back to this world? No one who sings as a pilgrim will ever find that he wasted his breath. And so the author ends by asking, what about you? Think back on recent days and months and years. Have you been sitting or have you been marching? And I will say that during this pandemic, this is Dana Smith speaking, it has been a lot easier to sit. Yes, wonderful times of prayer with God, wonderful times with family. But the longer this goes on, the more I, I, I find myself getting antsy and I want to be with people. And it, it becomes easy just to kind of, uh, another day that looks like yesterday. And if we're not careful, that can bleed into our spiritual life as well. He asks, have you been singing as we march? Even as a Christian, you may have settled for a relatively sedentary spirituality, but this will not do. Remember, Paul says, set your mind on things that are above, Colossians 3.2. And nothing promotes that kind of heavenly mindedness, quite like a deep-seated sense that your whole life is a journey being lived in the direction of heaven. And so let us live confident that one day we will be wayfaring strangers no more. We're only going over Jordan. We won't come back to this life. No, no. Our destination is to go home to live with God. And so let those words encourage you tonight. Let those words encourage you to uh, know that it's not your imitation of people, say, in Romans chapter 11 that gets you to heaven. No, 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 no. It is by virtue of grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. But we are to cultivate holiness now and to get our bodies in shape, if you will, to get ourselves in shape for heaven. And what that heavenly life will look like is to live a heavenly life now. So with that said, let me close this in prayer. Father, uh, we pray that we would live not only with an eye toward heaven, but with both eyes toward heaven, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, knowing that he who began a good work in us will see it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. And Lord, keep us faithful here. Let us live uh, here, uh, being earthly good here, by pointing people to Christ and by inviting them to come along to place their faith in Christ and give us a, a great holy joy even as we march towards Zion. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, and I will uh, see you next time I post. God bless.